law enforcement agencies have historically sought some degree of control over their employees. And scholars contend that the right to privacy or the right to be let alone has been the subject of much litigation in recent years. While the growing conservatism of the federal court has eroded the job-related privacy rights of criminal justice personnel, these employees have begun filing privacy-related lawsuits in state courts. Also, legislative changes at the state level have enhanced privacy rights among law enforcement personnel. Generally, when a criminal justice employer demands that an employee disclose personal matters, courts have ruled that the employer must show that, it, that its interest in the disclosure outweighs the officer's privacy interest. The information sought must also be relevant to an officer's on-the-job performance, and inquiries must typically be narrow. In other words, a criminal justice employer must not conduct a fishing expedition. Almost always, disclosure occurs at the hiring phase where job applicants sign waivers of privacy claims as conditions of employment, and these waivers have been upheld by courts everywhere. Also, courts have found that when once an employee is hired, the agency is permitted to disclose his or her salary information. In fact, some jurisdictions even require their officers to disclose a list of assets, debts, and income, as this is believed to deter corruption amongst public employees. Generally speaking, if there has been a pattern of past corruption, financial disclosure is more likely to be upheld by courts. Nevertheless, some states, such as California, have passed legislation which puts direct limits on the disclosure of financial information, which essentially grants more privacy to the employee. Also, collective bargaining agreements may grant employees protections against financial disclosure. For the most part, criminal justice employees have had little success in arguing that medical disclosure requirements violate the federal constitution, so long as an employer can show a reasonably direct relationship between the information and the employee's physical or emotional ability to perform the job, medical information can be collected or an officer can be compelled to submit to a medical examination or substance abuse evaluation. While courts have generally ruled on the side of the criminal justice agency, it is still best for managers of criminal justice personnel to conduct medical inquiries in a carefully and narrow manner. There should never again be anything resembling a fishing expedition. Interestingly, courts in some areas of the U.S. have recently held that it is illegal under the Americans with Disabilities Amendments Act for some employers to require their employees to produce a doctor's note justifying the routine use of sick time. I have no doubt that criminal justice agencies may still be doing this throughout the U.S., yet some courts find broad doctor's notes to violate requirements of the ADA. Now, while it might seem that courts have sided with the employee in some respects, what do you think happens when an employee submits to a fitness for duty evaluation by a doctor who is essentially retained by a third party. Does a doctor-patient relationship preclude the physician from revealing medical information derived from the examination? The answer is no. And the physician is not responsible for any loss that an employee may suffer as a result of a conclusion which is reached after conducting a medical examination. Generally, under freedom of information laws, disciplinary records of criminal justice employees tend to be a matter of public record in virtually all states. In fact, most public records laws provide very little protection for criminal justice personnel from the disclosure of disciplinary records and internal affairs files. Also, 
if an individual is filing a civil suit against an officer or the officer's employer, he or she is entitled to have access to relevant internal affairs, disciplinary records, and all other personnel of files. If an officer is involved in a deadly use of force incident, courts have also upheld that the public has a right to know the name of the officer who was involved, even though this may result in the harassment of the officers. Courts have been receptive to permitting criminal justice personnel to keep their home addresses and telephone numbers a secret. Also, if an, if an officer works undercover, photographs of this employee are also entitled to more protection. Obviously, it would be hazardous to the well-being of a criminal justice employee if his or her identity was known during an undercover operation. Having said this, non-undercover officers genuinely have no expectation of privacy when it comes to photographs since their faces are exposed to the public every day they work. Drug testing of criminal justice personnel does not violate federal law, but it should be random. Employees should not be signaled out. However, if there is reasonable suspicion that an employee has used illegal drugs, it is gener generally permissible to require the employee to submit to a drug test. Here are some examples of facts which courts have found to constitute reasonable suspicion justifying a drug test. The unsubstantiated allegation of a fellow officer or for former girlfriend has been found to constitute reasonable suspicion leading to a drug test. Also, an officer's glassy-eyed appearance and unusual behavior were found sufficient to warrant a drug test. And a drug-sniffing dog who gave a signal while passing through a locker room was found to provide reasonable suspicion. Clearly, there is a high degree of subjectivity and discretion. Also, collective bargaining agreements may pose an obstacle and might even provide a barrier of protection for employees. It is prudent for managers of criminal justice personnel to be familiar with the applicable state laws and collective bargaining agreements before requiring an employee to submit to a drug test. And if a drug test is required, employers must take care to ensure that careful collection techniques are used to prevent contamination of the sample. Also, courts have held that if an employee requests to have an attorney or union representative present during the drug test, this must be honored by the employer. And finally, most courts have held that it is a violation of privacy for the employer to observe the employee's act of urination during the drug test. Occasionally, circumstances may arise where managers of criminal justice personnel feel a need to conduct a workplace search in order to provide misconduct in order to prove misconduct committed by one of their subordinates. These administrative searches must be based upon a similar reasonable suspicion standard. If a workplace search is based upon less than reasonable suspicion, it will only be valid if the search is in an area where the officer has no expectation of privacy such as, for example, the employee break room. There are also some type of workplace searches that may not need reasonable suspicion. For example, many correctional agencies have instituted random general searches for employees. This can consist of a combination of pat searches, searches of personal belongings, and searches of vehicles. So long as these are truly random, courts tend to uphold their constitutionality. There is, after all, a legitimate governmental interest in ensuring that corrections officers do not introduce contraband into penal institutions. The issue of whether or not an employer can utilize secret video surveillance equipment to monitor criminal justice employees is an area of the law which is still emerging. In 2008, the Ninth Circuit Court ruled that the warrantless video surveillance of a police locker room constituted an invasion of privacy.
The court opined that officers in a locker room had a reasonable expectation of privacy. Also, courts have ruled that restrooms are typically afforded a similar level of protection. Nevertheless, it will be interesting to see what courts have to say about other areas of the workplace which are monitored. This is an area of privacy law where there are gray areas which have not fully been examined by the court system. Even though it is unadvisable for a criminal justice employee to have off-duty personal affairs or sexual relationships, numerous courts have held that law enforcement agencies may not discipline an employee who engages in this practice. Courts throughout the country have been willing to reinstate employees who have been terminated for having affairs. Even if an employee is married and decides to cheat on his or her spouse, in most cases this individual's employer cannot discipline the employee as this would constitute a breach of privacy. If an affair is conducted off-duty and is not deemed to interfere with one's job performance, it is highly unlikely that a court will affirm an, employee's, an employer's decision to discipline the employee. In the few cases where courts have been willing to do so, there must be a direct correlation between an officer's extracurricular activities and poor job performance. This burden of proof is very strict and might include situations where an officer has an affair with a subordinate, or one where he or she has a sexual relationship with a crime victim, a witness. And there is a po the possibility that an officer has, if an officer has an affair with a person with a felony record, this might expose the individual to disciplinary action. Certainly one area of privacy law which applies to law enforcement employees is that of the right to engage in off-duty employment. Many police officers will tell you that they can make an exorbitant amount of money by moonlighting at sporting events, nightclubs, and other entertainment venues. Often there is serious money to be made, which might even be larger than the regular paycheck. So the question is, does a law enforcement employer have a right to impose policies which regulate the working of a second job? The answer in most cases is yes. And, and the employer has a right to impose restrictions on these second jobs. Courts have reasoned that criminal justice employers need to ensure that officers work, that they report for work in good physical and mental condition. If, for example, an officer has worked 10 hours during a second job, it would not be wise for this individual to report for duty as a police officer. Also, moonlighting may create conflicts of interest and the employer has a right to prevent these from occurring. Having said this, employers must impose specific regulations related to off-duty employment. Also, if an employer bans some off-duty work, it has the burden of, pro of proving that there was a rational basis for this decision. And an employer cannot ban any type of off-duty work which somehow impacts an officer's free speech rights. For example, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a ban on employees receiving an honoraria for delivering speeches. Law enforcement personnel, like private citizens, enjoy the freedom of, free, the freedom of speech. And finally, employers generally cannot require the third-party employer to assume all of the costs of workmen's compensation and tort claim insurance for officers who moonlight at second jobs. The reasoning behind this is that courts have held that the law enforcement agency benefits whenever the officer takes true law enforcement action on behalf of a third party employer. Clearly there are multiple issues to consider regarding the right to privacy and the regulation of off-duty conduct for law enforcement personnel. It is with a great sense of hope that present and future managers of criminal justice personnel will carefully consider key, aspe key aspects of this presentation as this will ensure that law enforcement officers are treated fairly and in accordance with their legal rights and liberties.